Thank you, and uh, good morning and welcome from myself as well. Uh, so I, I just want to take a little time and talk about databases, database transactions, con concurrency control, and its place in our overall uh, little world of AppSec. So starting off a little bit about myself, my name is Victor. I currently work as an application security engineer for Doensec. We are a small consultancy boutique mostly focusing on white box security audits. So most of my days are spent looking at uh, our client's code. And I've also done my fair share of uh, development in the past. And here are some socials if anybody wants to get in touch. And of course, that's me on the right hand side. So. Um, almost all of our systems applications today utilize a database uh, in, a, in, in some capacity. It may be used for primary storage, it may be used for caching, it may be used in some denormalized, uh, uh, for some denormalized data for uh, optimizing for access, but in any case, we have a database. However, uh, an unfortunate thing is that we treat our databases as a black box. We spin up a container, we install the database, connect to it, and start reading and writing, and that's sufficient enough for almost all of our workloads. And I've been guilty of that myself. But, uh, and we usually don't take time to take a, uh, to look under the hood and see how the thing actually operates. So I want to, uh, use this presentation to shed some light on a particular aspect, specifically database transactions, and uh, I think it's always best to start off with an example. So uh, this is a small uh, snippet of Go code, and I apologize if anybody is not familiar with Go, but we're not using any language-specific stuff, so it should be pretty understandable. And this is a, a normal, typical transfer function that you would see in any fintech software. Um, and as you would expect, um, you have a source account and a destination account and the amount that you want to wish to transfer between them. And we start off by establishing a connection to our database. Next, first thing we do actually is start a database transactions. And if case anybody in the audience is not familiar, uh, a database transaction is defined as a unit of work where it essentially groups uh, two or more database operations, ensuring that they are um, executed entirely uh, and independent of any other transactions that may be also um, executing on the database at the time. So with the database, uh, with the transaction created, we start off by first selecting our source account and doing some due diligence validation on the amount that's being transferred, checking whether it's negative or it, if it potentially exceeds the balance that the source account currently has in our system. And if those um, validations fail, we roll back the transaction, essentially telling the database to cancel everything that we might have previously done and uh, finish our, uh, and basically error out. Uh, however, if the validation passes, then we do what's expected for a typical transfer. We subtract the amount from our source account and add it to our destination account, finishing by committing the transaction, essentially telling the database, okay, we are done here. Feel free to store everything on disk. And uh, now let's do a little demo here and see how this actually works. So over here, I have a, the, the same Go snippet running in the background. And we can see that currently in the database, we have two accounts, Alice with a balance of 100 and Bob with a balance of 20. And we can perform a transfer between them and specifically transferring 50 from Alice to Bob. And if we do that and rerun our dump command, we see that the transfer succeeded and uh, Bob's account increased. If we try to do the same thing again, it'll work because initially Alice had 100 and verifying that our, all our validation works correctly. If we try the third time, we see an invalid balance because we already have a zero for Alice's account. This is all fine uh, and works as expected. But now let's try something, uh, something different. And actually, let's see. Okay, everything is reset. Now let's try and make more transactions, as in a lot of transactions in a short amount of time. And this is a short snippet of Go code, which essentially does the same transfer operation programmatically, transferring again the same amounts uh, from account one to account two with a, a transfer amount of 50. The only difference here is, is that we're going to try and do 10 transfers, and each of those transfers is essentially gonna be a separate thread. And this is the, basically that Go, uh, language construct that uh, executes each of those functions as a separate thread. Uh, 
Now, if we try to do that, uh, given that, again, just to verify that Alice only has 100 and we're transferring 50, we would expect to see two, uh, two successful transfers and everything else should fail, right? Given that we already verified that our validation works correctly. Now, if we run this, we will see something different. We actually see that all 10 of our requests were accepted and processed by uh, our small application, right? And checking the balance now, we see something interesting. We were able to overdraw the account. So what's happening? Uh, let's quickly go back to our snippet and try to see if anything's wrong here, right? So this is our code. We see that we do due diligence by doing validation. We have a, uh, we set up a database transaction ensuring that there will be no partial executions. So we always ensure that everything is, uh, everything is fully executed, maintaining a consistent state in our, uh, in our application. But something definitely went wrong from the results that we saw in the demo. So if it's not on the application level, then it's a good guess that maybe it's one layer down. So let's take a look at the database. And the best way to do that is by enabling database logs, essentially doing print debugging and see what's actually being executed on the database. And this is one example of um, database logs that you would see if you were to run the previous example. And let's do some nice cleanup here, name our transactions, do some highlighting. And we initially see something interesting. So the definition is that uh, for a database transaction is that it's a unit that is executed isolated from other concurrently executing transactions. But from logs, we see something completely different. We see the, trans uh, the individual operations from the transaction actually being interweaved. So what gives? Something is definitely um, doesn't match with uh, our assumption. Uh, and uh, the reason is that as like any high performance software, databases aim to execute as much of their workload concurrently that uh, maximizes throughput and in, in, um, improves performance. And the way that's done on a database level is by implementing a set of workers. So workers will be the units, um, units in charge for, performing, for executing the transactions, and there's a component called a scheduler that will essentially take all of the uh, incoming uh, transactions and assign them to a free worker based on maybe some criteria that the database uh, uh, defines. And once all of the transactions are assigned, they will be executed by the workers. Uh, now, if we focus a little bit on this set of workers here, um, we can also think of the workers as normal application threads and think of the transactions as um, the functions or the procedures that will be executed within that uh, thread. And if we squint a little bit, we can almost think of this set of uh, workers as your typical multi-threaded C application. You have the code and you have the threads executing the code. And a common problem that you run into when uh, in concurrent execution environments is race conditions. And similar thing happens on the database. And how, you, how do you deal with race conditions on the application level is by using locks. And databases are no different. So if you look at the uh, SQL standard, uh, we can see that the, the standard defines uh, two types of locks for databases. The first one is called a read lock, which is placed on an entry that is, uh, whenever an entry is read. And it's also called a shared lock because um, you are able to place multiple locks of its kind on the same entry. On the other hand, we have a write lock, which is placed on an entry whenever an entry is being updated. And it, they are also called exclusive locks because only a single exclusive lock can be placed on an entry at a time. And this uh, small table here shows the relationship between them. So if we have no locks uh, active on a specific entry, we can see that we can acquire any types of lock. If we have a shared lock already active, uh, then a concurrent transaction can acquire a shared lock, but is not allowed to uh, acquire an exclusive lock. And if an exclusive lock is already um, active, then no other locks can be acquired for that, uh, for that specific entry. And one thing I want to point out here is that under normal circumstances, without any additional configuration of the transaction, of the SQL you're executing, select statements do not acquire any locks on the entries that are read. Keep this in mind, we're gonna come back to this a bit later on. Now, locks are all fine if you use them correctly, but what happens if they're not properly implemented, if they're not properly utilized? And what happens is something that the SQL standard calls read phenomena, which is essentially 
undefined behavior or unexpected behavior that might happen when con con transactions are being concurrently executed. And the standard defines uh, three uh, read phenomena, specifically dirty reads, non-repeatable reads, and phantom reads. There's actually a fourth one, but we won't concern ourselves with, uh, with that one for now. And let's just quickly look at them in, uh, in a bit more detail and see uh, what type of uh, behavior they describe. So for dirty reads, uh, we'll look at the scenario of two concurrently executing transactions. And we start off by, at the first transaction, where it will read some uh, entry from the database A, which at the time might have the value 5. And then it'll try to update that entry by incrementing its value by 10, essentially changing it to 15. Now, the second transaction might get execution, and we'll try to read the same entry. And because we allow dirty reads, we get the value 15. Also note that transaction one did not commit. So until the transaction commits or rolls back, the changes are not actually uh, materialized and persisted on the disk. So it, if, uh, if it happens that transaction one, for some business reason, application code reason, decides to revert, basically uh, rolling back all the changes, but transaction two continues executing, it'll uh, execute under the assumption that the value of uh, A was 15 while uh, it was actually reverted by transaction one, essentially giving you a dirty read. Um, next, we have non-repeatable reads. Again, we have the same scenario of two concurrently executing transactions, and we start off by transaction one reading some entry A, which has the value of five. Then transaction two might execute, do the same read, get the same value. This is, of course, expected. Next, transaction, uh, transaction one will update the value and commit, essentially, uh, persisting the value of 15 for that entry A. Now, if for some uh, business reason, transaction two decides to repeat the same read as it initially did, it'll see a different value. Again, giving us some inconsistencies and based on the assumption the application code makes, this can cause uh, problems down the line. And phantom reads are uh, essentially the same thing, just a generalization of the non-repeatable reads, where non-repeatable reads were concerning themselves with a single entry. Uh, phantom reads uh, concern themselves with a set of entries, so essentially a query that has some predicate. Uh, again, we have the same uh, same scenario, and initially we, we start off by uh, with a transaction two reading all entries that are larger than 50, and let's say that in this case we get uh, entries A and B, and then we get transaction uh, one which will insert a new entry and then commit. And similar scenario if transaction two then for some reason repeats the, the same read as before, it'll get a completely different set, again, giving us inconsistencies within the transaction um, while the transaction is being executed. Now, this is what the SQL, um, the SQL specification gives us. However, the real world is much more complicated. So um, on top of the uh, on top of the read phenomenon that the SQL standard defines, we can also, in the real world, encounter read skews, write skews, and lost updates. We're not going to go into detail on them, but we'll look at examples a bit further down the line. And uh, Microsoft, uh, this is an old paper actually, but some Microsoft engineers have a good like critique on the original uh, SQL standard, so it's definitely worth a read if you are into uh, databases and database internals. Now, let's quickly go back to our initial uh, analogy that we did of that multi-threaded C application. So, if we have um, concurrent execution in any application, we run the risk of encountering race conditions. And we mitigate them by using locks. Essentially, if we have um, a concurrent read or concurrent write on some shared resource and concurrent ex uh, multi-threaded execution, there's, there's our race condition. And the way to fix that is by is by introducing a lock, essentially blocking off that uh, section, the, the set of uh, operations, the set of instructions that are performing the shared re uh, the concurrent read or concur uh, concurrent write on the shared resource. Effectively, uh, marking off a critical section within our application and specifying that only one thread can execute those set of instructions. And we can kind of apply the same thinking for our transaction. This is the same SQL that we saw in our initial Go snippet, just ripped off uh, for clarity's sake. And uh, now think back a little bit uh, to where we talked about locks. Select statements by default do not place any locks uh, on the entries they access, which means that the first update that executes is going to be the first operation that's going to place any lock on the data that we are operating, essentially placing our um, critical section somewhere here. And from now, it's kind of obvious what's happening. We have a clear data race on our read operation, 
which, as we saw in the demo, leads to our exploitable race condition, which, um, um, yeah. Uh, so now let's actually take a look and see what's happening on the database when uh, this type of a race condition is being exploited. So this is our code snippet. So let's walk through um, execution of two concurrent transactions and see what's happening. Um, and this is our starting scenario. Initially, like we had in the demo, we have a source account with a balance of 100, destination account with a balance of uh, 20, and we are transferring the full amount from the source to the destination. And we start off by first reading uh, our source account, and we get a balance of 100. And the same thing can be done for, uh, by the second transaction, which will also get the same value. Next. Uh, we come back to the application code and perform our validations, and the same thing can be done over on the other side. Now, if transaction one is the first transaction that gets execution and starts uh, performing the updates, um, we will see, we will actually place an exclusive lock on the entry that's being modified, and in this case, we will modify the balance of the source account by, uh, by actually subtracting 100 from whatever is currently stored in our database, which will change its balance to zero, and now if transaction two tries to do the same thing because it encounters an exclusive lock, it may not proceed, so it'll essentially halt and wait while the lock is being, uh, while the lock is, uh, until the lock is released, so it'll continue execution. And if we assume that these are the only two transactions that are currently being executed, then which, that means that uh, transaction one is free to complete its operations in its entirety. So the, the last thing essentially that it has to do is update the destination account. Again, updating its current balance by 100, which gives it a balance of uh, 120, and we commit releasing the locks and ending with a state of uh, zero for the source account and 120 for the destination account. So now that the locks are released, we can proceed executing transaction two. It'll try to do the same update, subtracting 100 from the current balance of the source account. But note one thing. Uh, initially, that transaction read a source balance of 100, but after the first transaction committed, the balance changed. So now when it tries to uh, uh, execute the update and subtract 100, it'll actually subtract 100 from the current balance, which is zero, which ultimately puts places the balance of the source account to minus 100. And then continuing on, we update the balance of the destination account, ending with a commit and a, ne a negative balance for the source account and a, a in increasing inflated balance for the destination account, which is exactly what we saw in our initial demo. Uh, we can also see a minor twist on this formula, and the only difference between the previous code snippet and this one is that the calculation happens on the application side. So in the previous example, we updated the balance by taking the current balance and subtracting whatever was requested. Over here, we calculate the new balance on the application level and simply push down that value telling the database, okay, for this account, store this value as the balance. So let's see what happens here. And again, we have, we have the same exact scenario. Uh, and we start off basically doing the same thing. We read both accounts on both transactions, get the same value perform the application, I mean, execute the application code by performing the validation and uh, calculating the new amounts. Same thing on both sides. And then first transaction executes, tries to set the balance to zero, which was calculated on the application level. It succeeds and places a lock, which blocks the second transaction, allowing the first transaction to uh, fully execute. Uh, and it will execute the leftover operations by updating the destination balance to 120, and then commit leaving the balance uh, to something like this. Now, if we go back to our second transaction, now that the locks are released, it'll try to do the same thing. It'll set the balance to zero uh, for the source account. It'll set the balance to 120 for the destination account and commit leaving the database in exactly the same state as it was in the first transaction. So in this scenario, there's nothing obviously wrong if we just look at the database and the state that it's currently in the database. But we also have to think about the surrounding application code that's running this, uh, this transaction, right? So if we assume that the application running is some sort of a microservice architecture that will uh, do the typical thing by accepting a request, going uh, goes, uh, where the request goes through the typical authentication, authorization, input validation uh, flows, and then ultimately ends up at our uh, to our database transaction, uh, initially try, uh, essentially trying to update our database. And the application is set up in a way that if the database update is successful, uh, 
then it will call some external downstream service T that will perform the actual physical transfer between both accounts, uh, we end up running into a problem. Because if you remember, we were able to exploit the race condition and perform the database update twice. While the state is seemingly consistent, the downstream service will be called twice or n times depending on how, how, many, how many times you were able to hit that uh, race window. And uh, a symptom of these types of architectures is that the downstream services usually fully trust whatever the main application sends without doing any additional validation because they assume that the main app already performed that. And if this is the case, the service team will gladly perform multiple transfers, again, leaving, uh, uh, allowing us uh, to exploit the application. And of course, you can, with the same scenario, you can do, again, uh, normal exploits. In this case, we have... Um, the source account trying to do concurrent transfers to different uh, destination accounts. And if we quickly run through the initial steps, um, we will see that the first transaction will perform the transfer and transfer 100 from the source to the destination account. And when the second transaction tries to do that uh, while transferring to a different destination account, we end up essentially printing money and transferring 100. Uh, so basically the same balance twice to two different destination accounts. And this is another way where uh, application logic uh, combined with a database can be, uh, can be exploited. Now, how do we actually exploit this if we see it in um, any application? Well, the easiest thing and what we saw initially is multi-threaded for loops. Just run a for loop, spin up some threads, make the request, and see how the application behaves. Um, and that's essentially what we saw with the Go client that made those requests initially. Uh, if there are any people that do security audits, pen tests, you almost certainly have Burp Suite installed on your machines, um, and you're probably familiar with Intruder, which is essentially a GUI for multi-threaded for loops. You can configure your request, you can specify the number of requests, and you can do testing that way. Uh, but some of you might have noticed that we exploited this locally. The client or the attacker and the application were running on the same machine, same network. The reality is, if you're an attacker or a pen tester, the target is probably out there on the open internet, which means you have network latency, you have drop packets, and you probably have a ton of infrastructure between you making the request and the request actually hitting the application server, such as application for, uh, web application firewalls, reverse proxies, and all of that has a negative impact on your ability to make as much as many requests as you can in a short instant to hit that race window. For that, there's a nice plugin for um, Burp Suite called Turbo Intruder, and this is a plugin written by James Kettle from Ports Figure Research. And uh, a really nice thing for the, uh, with this tool is that based on previous research done, done by James Kettle where he looked at some weird behavior of the TCP stack, um, uh, you are actually able to configure the Turbo Intruder tool with some, a small script to uh, abuse uh, those um, weird behaviors in the TCP stack, essentially allowing you to deliver a large amount of requests almost in the same instant to the application server, allowing you to more consistently uh, exploit the race condition. And those two techniques that he developed are last, called last byte sync, applicable to HTTP 1 systems, and a single packet attack uh, applicable to HTTP2. I'm not going to go into detail because it's definitely out of scope, but if anybody's interested, I highly recommend looking into uh, his research on this specific topic. Um, so, talked uh, we seen the problem. We talked about exploitation. Now, how can we actually fix this? Right? We are developers. We want our systems to actually function correctly. So, multiple ways of doing this. Uh, the first way we're going to look at it is optimistic locking. Now, the idea behind optimistic locking is, as the name says, being an optimist. You figure that nothing is going to go wrong and just do a conflict resolution at the end in case anything goes wrong. And uh, the way of usually this type of locking is implemented is by imp introducing a logical clock or usually a, some type of a version column in the table you are trying to protect and then checking whether the version of the entry you are updating changed between the time you read it and the time you are performing the update. If the version changed, that means someone changed it underneath you, so you have to roll back and retry the operation. And that's usually done, again, just simply in, by introducing a version column and uh, updating your update statements to also check for whether the version is the same as the version that you saw when you initially accessed the entry. 
the downside to this uh, this approach is that it is manual work. Unless the ORM or any type of library you're using to access the database does this out of the box, it means that it's code that the developers need to write, need to maintain, and it's another thing that you need to keep an eye out when doing pull request reviews. So while it works, it can be um, more work for the people that are actually developing the software. On the flip side, we have pessimistic logging. So if op optimists thought nothing goes wrong, pessimists think everything goes wrong, essentially acquiring all logs at the beginning of the transaction and releasing them only when you're sure that everything is, you've done the proper um, operations and you're sure that everything can be committed now. Uh, again, multiple ways to implement pessimistic locking. Uh, one way to do it is on the application level, essentially utilizing locking mechanisms that libraries or your language actually provides. Um, however, sa same drawback as with optimistic locking, this is manual code that you need to implement, something to keep an eye out at uh, when you do pull request reviews, and concurrent programming is difficult, so you still might end up making some error, ultimately bringing you back to square one, leaving you with an application that's being exploitable, that can be exploited. So this is not something that I would personally recommend, however, it is a possibility. Another way to implement pessimistic locking is on the database level. So uh, databases usually provide kind of like a modifier for select statements um, called for share or for update used essentially by tacking them out the, uh, at the end of your select statements, which instruct the database to place a lock uh, on the entry that's being read by the select statement. And the difference between them is for share will place a share or a read lock, and for update will place an exclusive lock, uh, an update or an exclusive lock. So this is one way for you to manually signal to the database that you want to perform locking. However, you still need to be careful because given, uh, given how some databases behave, you can still run into problems. So if you just quickly take a look at this example, you can see on the left-hand side, the transaction did uh, the proper thing by reading uh, some entry for update, meaning the lock is going to be placed, and then updating it and committing. However, on the second transaction, was also able to read that entry, even though the lock was placed, because the read doesn't signal any intent to update, so you are free to read as much as you want. You will, you will not be able to update it because of the lock, but you're, you, you'll be able to read it. So. If the first transaction commits before the second one commits, the commit of the second transaction will essentially override the commit of the first transaction, leading to a lost update, and again, a race condition given the mismatch between what's executed on the first transaction and what's executed on the second transaction. Now, it's worth noting that some databases, given a higher isolation level, may prevent this behavior, essentially blocking that read of the second transaction. And now, now that I mentioned isolation levels, we come to the third way of fixing this problem, and it's by using transaction isolation levels. And this is essentially the concurrency mechanism implemented by databases. So uh, transaction isolation levels are essentially properties that you set on your transactions when you create them. So if you're, say, uh, if you're creating a transaction, you would say begin transaction, set isolation level X, and then you specify the required isolation level, telling the database to which uh, extent your transaction will be isolated from other concurrently executing transactions at the time. The gold standard for this, specified by the SQL, um, um, uh, by the specification, is serializable. If you're running transactions in a serializable isolation level, you effectively have the same behavior as if you were to run them in a serial order. First, then the second, then the third one. So um, you can also imagine that this will come with penalties. Depending on how the database actually implements concurrency control, you can either run into a lot of uh, lock acquisition, which is expensive, or you can run into failed transactions that you need to retry. Again, not good user experience. And because of that, uh, the developers have recognized this, and they also provide additional uh, additional isolation levels, which are a bit weaker, uh, so basically uh, loosen the constraints uh, implemented or provided by serializable. And the other ones are called repeatable reads, read committed, and read uncommitted. And this table essentially shows the um, relationship between them. So um, we can see serializable will block all our read phenomenon that we initially saw. And as we traverse down the table, we see the, the green tick marks appearing, which means that if you're running, for instance, in read committed, you will be able, uh, you might uh, observe unrepeatable reads or phantom reads, which is maybe something that you do not want for that specific operation. Now, uh, I just want to take some time and talk a, a little bit about um, 
database implementation. So first thing, uh, I was a bit vague before when I said uh, when you create a transaction by default without any additional configuration. And by that, I meant not specifying the isolation level. So if you just create a transaction without specifying the isolation level, it, uh, it will run with whatever the database specifies as default, which is usually read committed. And um, sometimes, and oftentimes for business critical operations, this is not something that you actually want to see. And this also differs between database vendors. For instance, MySQL has repeatable read as its default. Um, Postgres does not implement read uncommitted. So if you're using Postgres, the lowest isolation level you can use is, is read committed. Uh, if you use CockroachDB, the default is serializable, so you're pretty good uh, without doing any additional work for CockroachDB. Um, and also, the, the way that the, the isolation levels are implemented differs between what's actually explained in the standard. So repeatable reads, for instance, in Postgres are not the actual repeatable reads described in the standard, but it's something that's called um, snapshot isolation, which is somewhere between serializable reads and repeatable reads. And an interesting case is Oracle, where uh, Oracle only supports two isolation levels, serializable and read committed. But Oracle serializable is actually equivalent to Postgres's repeatable read. So it's not pure serializability, but it is a snapshot isolation. So if you're using Oracle, read the documentation and be careful because you might run into some issues where you might figure that by using serializable, you are essentially having a serial order of transactions, but you still might run into problems. So point being, a lot of this stuff, it depends on how the database uh, developers chose to implement uh, I chose to implement isolation levels. Uh, and finally, I just want to give uh, a quick word about detection. So creating a transaction and setting the isolation level is just a pattern, something that can be grabbed from your code. If you have, uh, if you have raw SQL, then it's a pattern of begin transaction set isolation level X. If you're using some ORM, you are probably either passing a parameter where you specify the transaction isolation level or maybe some setter doing the same thing. And we can use simple SEMgrep rules to, grab for, uh, to detect that type of stuff. So this is one example where uh, the rule will look for a, a transaction creation with raw SQL without specifying the isolation level. If you're using ORM for our previous example, which is a Postgres example specifically, um, this call for begin transaction, if, if the pattern finds it without any additional parameters, it means it will use the database's default. And this is a uh, one extension, uh, an extension of the previous one. So if the op options are set when the transaction is created, but the ISO level is not specified, again, this rule will point it out to you. A big downside to this is, is this is really noisy. There is a, a high probability that 90% of the transactions you have in your systems are not business critical and do not need to be run with a serializable, uh, with a serializable isolation level because that will probably cause a lot of uh, performance issues. Uh, but again, this is a good starting off point to at least get some inventory of all the transactions that you have in your systems and then go back and see where stuff can be tweaked, can be hardened so the application ends up being more secure in the long run. And uh, I mentioned the standard a lot of times. Um, the standard came out late 80s. There was a revision in 92, I think, where they added the isolation levels. So this is not anything new. People have been developing, working uh, on databases, improving concurrency control for a long time. Uh, but uh, the unfortunate reality is that this is not something that we think about on a daily basis. Um, so if you're not a hardcore database nerd, if you haven't taken a database uh, design course or read a database textbook, there's a highly likelihood that you're not thinking about database concern, concurrency. And we've seen that, uh, the result of that is that we've seen issues like this pop up in the tests we do, and there are also issues that we've seen in the wild. So these are, these are two examples of, um, of uh, Bitcoin exchanges, uh, crypto exchanges, where if you look at the, the links uh, at the bottom, you will see that they describe essentially what we saw in our initial demo. An attacker was able to do uh, a large amount of requests in a short amount of time, essentially making off with hundreds of thousands of dollars in some, um, in some crypto uh, currency. And for takeaways, um, databases introduce another level of concurrency on top of what you already think about when you, uh, when you develop your applications. And 
regardless of where you land on that level, you need to think about concurrency control. Uh, databases are not different, and it is important specifically for business critical operations. Um, and I initially said we uh, think of databases as a black box. It shouldn't be like that. It's really simple to uh, enable uh, logs on a database and test it yourself. Spin up a Docker container with Postgres or MySQL or your database by choice. Open up two terminal windows and start executing transactions. You can see what logs are being acquired. You can see which operations hang. You can see when you commit what state is actually being uh, persisted. So it is really simple to test. It's a five minute setup and you can play with it as much as you can, as much as you want. And finally, familiarize, familiarize yourself with the tools you're using. So as I mentioned before, uh, the SQL standard is one thing, but implementations differ. So, Familiarize yourself with the database you're using so you don't run into weird caveats that might leave your application ultimately vulnerable. And uh, read the documentation. Documentation is real nice. Postgres has nice documentation. MySQL has really nice documentation. And you never know. You might run into some additional features that your database vendor of choice provides that other ones don't, which might be the perfect uh, for your specific use case, providing a uh, good trade-off between uh, safety and performance. And uh, yeah, with that, I'd like to wrap it up. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I think we have time for questions. Okay, uh, just to understand, when you say implement these systems fully, you mean the isolation levels? So, uh, okay, the question is, if a new application is being developed, are there any recommendations for databases that fully implement isolation levels? The thing is, they all do. There are minor differences, but usually they all do implement. If you have a relational transactional database, you will have concurrency control uh, implemented via isolation levels. The only difference is that there, there might be differences between how the developers chose to implement them, so that is essentially a matter of looking up the documentation or looking up resources online and see if there are any weird caveats that might uh, come back and bite you. But we're, if we're talking about relational databases, almost all of them will support these isolation levels. Uh, I also, uh, this is off the top of my head, but I think uh, NoSQL databases uh, pretty recently also added transactions, but uh, this was a bit out of scope because I initially tried to focus on relational databases, but if someone is uh, potentially running a NoSQL database, there probably uh, at this point is a way to do transactions and concurrency control also within those types of databases. Uh, you, uh, you mean the code? Yeah, so the slides and there will be a accompanying blog post and uh, snippets of code if you want to play. Everything will be published, I think, in the next couple of weeks or so. Problem? Does anybody else have another question? You go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering um, if you have a lot of Mm -hmm. uh, but also at the same time, uh, how would you mitigate performance uh, decrease uh, when essentially all transactions are crypto and can't be concurrent? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the question is if everything that's executing on the database is critical, how can, uh, what's a good trade off between performance and security? Well, uh, the, the boring and correct answer is it depends, I guess, like with everything when it comes to software. Uh, but I think if it is business critical, that uh, performance kind of goes down the ladder, I think, because it's much more important to have things executing properly than things executing correctly. Uh, that being said, it also, again, depends on the application. Uh, there are different isolation levels, and maybe serializable is too much for your business case. Maybe snapshot isolation or Postgres is equivalent to read, uh, repeatable read is exactly what you need. So... Maybe that's something you can look into, or maybe even trying doing uh, manual locking. If uh, that's something that can be applied if it's not a massive application, but uh, that's always a case by case basis. Maybe doing manual locking as opposed to leaving it to the database can be something uh, can be an option. Uh, 
But again, it could be error prone, which might leave you back to square one. So it, it is a difficult question to answer, unfortunately. There's, there's no clear answer. It's always a trade-off. Does anybody else have any questions? Okay, uh, I think I have a question of my own that I took note here with me. Um, I wanted to know if you yourself personally, uh, within, I don't know, a project, in a project context, if you've developed any kind of automated tests to detect these kinds of issues. Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, at a previous job where we were developing essentially a fintech software type of a thing, we ended up uh, implementing, uh, when we realized that we had the issue, uh, we ended up writing simple unit tests to uh, run this. And writing tests is fairly straightforward. If you have the proper uh, harnesses to spin up a simple instance of the app, you, you just run a for loop, make the requests, and then verify whether the result that ends up being in the database is what you expected. If it's not, then you end up having a race condition and... Uh, yeah, it is pretty simple to do and something that we have done. And basically, the initial Go code that I showed that did the multi-threaded uh, uh, multi request is what a test would look like. Again, it depends on the complexity of the application, but the initial harness, for loop, spin up threads, and then wait for them to end up, read the database, verify what state is there is essentially the steps you need to take to uh, implement unit tests. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All right, that was um, Victor Chuchurski's um, talk. Uh, thank you for your time here. Uh, we're gonna make, we're gonna have a quick uh, 15 minute break and um, afterwards we're gonna move on to our next talk. Thank you. Thanks everyone.